welcome to the Division for Diversity and Inclusion's Saturn the Silences series. My name is Dr. Ken Coopwood, and I'm the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion here at Missouri State University. This series is a year-round effort to help educate, give credence and voice to important topics for our campus, its divisions, its departments, groups, and individuals. We need these forums to discuss local, regional, and national matters that are important to us. We do not want to be silent about such things, but instead we want to speak up and speak out with the intention to help dispel myths and to inspire truth. But mostly, the series is designed to bring our campus together for unified service to our students and to each other. Thank you for joining us. Now, let's turn our attention to the topic of this video. Thank you for that introduction. I realize today that this is going to be recorded. I tend to be a wanderer, but our recording device is over here, so I'm going to have to be located mostly on this side of the room. I'm not ignoring you over there. I'll, I'll come over there if I can. Uh, wasn't sure of the introduction I was going to have, but instead of doing a long laundry list of a resume, I decided just to put up some, some logos and icons of educational institutions that I've been at, um, companies that I've worked for over my career, countries that I've lived, because people always ask me which country, which of the six countries, you'll see the US flag is missing, but that's kind of the operating system in the background. I live here now. Um, I do want to point out, this is logo uh, of my company that was actually developed and designed by an MSU uh, graduate student. And so I'm trying to keep the business local uh, I was very happy with his design, so I've used that. You might not be familiar with this icon here. I do a lot of nonprofit work as well as my business. This is the icon for the, the logo for the Center for Diversity and Reconciliation, also based here in Springfield. Uh, we're working along uh, lines of trying to reconcile and educate people around issues of differences and appreciating our differences. Uh, Women for Women International, some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, it's an organization that's global that works with women in conflict areas uh, to move them from crisis and poverty to self-sufficiency. And because I'm an animal lover, and I believe that we share a planet with these living creatures, that we should protect them as well. So uh, just a little bit about my background. If you want more information or just to, to uh, look at my mini blog, I am mini blogging about microaggressions. You can go to leapintoleadership.com. So that's just my marketing pitch right there. So, I want to live in a world. I want to live in a world. I want to live in a world where George Zimmerman, on that fateful night, pulls his car over, rolls down the window, and says, hey, it's going to rain. Would you like a ride home? And a young Trayvon Martin says, yeah, man, that would be great. Thanks. That's the world that I want to live in. Do you? Do you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's the world that I want to live in. How are we going to get that world? It's not that world we live in now because of things that everyone in this room is doing. And that's the reality check. And I'm here to give you that reality check. <laughs> I'm not going to sugarcoat things. I'm a truth teller. And so today is about pulling the fog away, making it clear as to what we are doing that is preventing that world from happening. The movie The Matrix is brilliant on so many levels. How many people here have seen the movie The Matrix? If you haven't, I highly recommend it because there are a lot of deep messages in this movie. And so there's a scene between Morpheus and Neo and Neo is the main character, played by Keanu Reeves, Keanu Reeves and Morpheus by Lawrence Fishburne. Brilliant, brilliant scene. It's on YouTube. And basically, Morpheus is offering, offering Neo a choice. I'm going to give you the choice. I'm going to give you a choice of a blue pill or a red pill. And the blue pill is you can just go on as you're living every day. Ignorance is bliss. No change. 
Or I can give you the red pill, and if I give you the red pill, you're going to know the truth. You're going to see the reality, because they're operating in a matrix that's controlled, controlled by computers. So he takes the red pill. And the truth and the realities of the world that he lives in is revealed. Now, I'm going to give you that choice today. And the reason I'm giving you that choice is because with awareness comes responsibility. So at the end of this hour, if you walk out of here knowing what I'm going to tell you today, the truth about what's going on, and you don't take action, you have failed in your responsibility to make that world that you want to live in a reality. So does anyone want to leave now? Are you sure? I'm giving you that choice. Okay, I'm assuming you've all taken the red pill now. So the truth is now going to be revealed. So there are consequences to our behavior. And sometimes they're clear, and sometimes they're not clear. Sometimes we really understand, hey, I say this stupid thing, I'm going to get in trouble. It just happened this week with an owner of an NBA team. He got caught on tape. And I'm glad they came down as hard as they did. Well, I'll mention that a little bit later. So there are definitely consequences to our behavior, but sometimes our lives feel like this. How many of you feel like your lives are like this? Now? Come on, honestly. I mean, and it's good luck, right? There is no operating manual. You know, I worked for Microsoft for many years. We had an operating system. Sometimes it didn't work as well. But we don't have that manual. We're pulled in all these directions. We're given all of these different mixed messages. We think about the healthcare industry. Saturated fat, unsaturated fat. We never know what the truth is. And we're constantly bombarded by the newest thing, the latest thing. I'm doing some work around uh, terminology, microaggressions, and people are always getting hung up on the terms. It keeps changing. What do we call people? And it'd be so much easier if we just had this clear path where everything was aligned and we knew where to go. Well, unfortunately, because you all took the red pill, I'm going to add to this confusion. <laughs> so you're going to have one more thing that you're going to have to navigate. But I'm going to give you something today that will help you. It's one of the best kept secrets on the planet. And I wish this were more filled. So, Go out and spread the word about this best kept secret, because this will help you. <laughs> if you just take five minutes a day and do nothing, five minutes, that's all I'm going to ask you to do, is five minutes a day and do nothing, you will see an impact on your life. Because that previous slide where you're pulled in all these directions 24-7, constantly bombarded, feeling stressed out, how many of you actually stop for five minutes and do absolutely nothing? Okay, we've got one person, two. Okay, great. Some people call this mindfulness, prayer, centering, meditation. I've done a lot of work around mindfulness, especially in corporate America, because executives and people in work are stressed out. They're burning out got to find a way, we're asking people to do more with less, to have them center and reconnect. So just five minutes a day, and you have to do it consistently every day. So I'm going to give you some signs today, some warnings, some heads up, so that you don't fall over that cliff. So I'll start with this very heavy question. Have you ever considered that what you're doing on a daily basis is perpetuating discrimination and disparities in our society? We're all doing it. And most of us are doing it unconsciously. We're not even aware that we're doing it because we've been socially conditioned. So I'm going to be pulling the blindfolders off and hopefully, by the end of the session, you will understand some things that you've been conditioned to do that are creating some psychological stress and dilemmas for people in the non-dominant groups. So 
some of you might have seen this slide before if you take a psychology class. But basically, it's talking about your behaviors being above the waterline, what people see, what people describe you, or how they describe you. And obviously, your behaviors are based on your attitudes, your beliefs, your assumptions. What's important about this is that we only see your behaviors. We see what's above the waterline. That's your reputation. Your identity is below that. And reputation and identity are different. And when I do executive coaching, I always tell my clients, you want to narrow that gap between identity and reputation. Sometimes I get accused by those uh, most close to me that I don't, I don't express my emotion. I'm not very emotional. I am very emotional. I am very compassionate. My identity is I feel deeply, so deeply sometimes. It brings me to my knees. But I don't show it. I don't cry a lot. My husband cries more than I do. And that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't show that emotion as openly. And so my, my identity of being a very connected, emotional person and my reputation of not showing that emotion is different. You understand? The difference between the emotion of our reputation and identity. So the lens with which we see the world is really shaped by those attitudes, those beliefs, those values. And it's powerful. And the scholars call that social conditioning. That social conditioning is really a powerful driver of how we behave, the impact that we have on the world. Now here's something that is very, very key to understanding this whole concept about microaggression, is that no one of us is immune from inheriting the biases, the prejudices of our society. And much of this happens outside of our level of conscious awareness. In fact, there was a study done uh, by a researcher called Tapton Drew, and he was studying this effect called inattentional blindness. And he wanted to understand how radiologists, who are experts at seeing, were able to see these cancer nodules on these slides when he couldn't do that. He would actually sit next to a, 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 a radiologist and say, I can't see these cancer nodules. How can you? And radiologists spend many, many years learning how to read these slides, <laughs> to read the MRIs, to read how you detect cancer nodules on these images. And so he put together a study where he said, hmm, but what are they missing? What are they missing? And so he dressed someone up into a gorilla suit with an angry pose, and he superimposed it on the slide. And he said, okay, I'm going to show it to all these radiologists, this gorilla that's on the slide, and let's see what happens. So how, what percent of radiologists do you think did not see the gorilla on the slide? What percentage? 70%. 70%? Anybody higher? Lower? 83%. 83%. And maybe some of you in the front row can see it. Can you see it here? Gorilla? Ah, okay. So 83% of the radiologists did not see the gorilla on the slide, even though their eyes physically landed on it. What is that telling us? They weren't looking for it. Their brain, they weren't being asked to look for that. They were being asked to look for cancer nodules. So the way that their minds framed what they were doing affected the outcome. And this is really critical because what we're thinking about, what society tells us to focus on, what our peers tell us to focus on, what the news programs that we are told what to focus on, filters our world so aggressively, it literally shapes what we see and becomes a reality. We're in the matrix. Social conditioning, so powerful. So powerful. So we talk about this... Uh, we talk about people, the challenge that we have is we're well-intentioned. I believe everybody here has good intention. But intention and impact are two different things. And I'm a cup half full, per, half full person, I'm an optimist. But I do believe that the majority of people have goodwill and don't want to consciously go out and discriminate and make other people feel bad. 
And so the challenge is, if we're fair-minded and we believe that about ourselves, our, our identity, we would never consciously discriminate, right? Does anyone here actually consciously discriminate? Not that you would admit it in public, but, um, <laughs> but we do. And I believe that about people. And so if we look at the legal definition of discrimination, and this is from the 1973 Federal Anti-Discrimination Act, here, it's really about formulating opinions about people uh, not based on who they are, really, but about the groups that we believe things about, about assumed characteristics. And there's another movie, uh, Philadelphia, with Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington, where they're at the library, and Denzel, an African-American lawyer, doesn't want to take on Tom Hanks as a client because he has AIDS, and he has all these preconceived notions about AIDS. Of course, this movie was at the height of the AIDS crisis. And so they talk about this legal definition of discrimination. But we morphed, we morphed into kind of a version 2.0 of the isms, and we can kind of combine all of those uh, racism, sexism, heterosexism, um, discrimination. And so we've gone from kind of the overt, blatant forms of discrimination to this nebulous, amorphous, ambiguous, vague kind of microaggression, which is what it's being called now, micro equity, micro validation, micro assaults. And we can look at that as a thousand cuts. Now, you can't see that. It's a six and stones may break my bones, but your words are killing my best friends. Little drops, little cuts. And what does that do? So if we look at just the textbook definition, and this really comes from Daryl Wing Sue, who is the um, author of an excellent source book, which is really my source, um, from Columbia College, Teachers College. He kind of describes it like this, and it's wordy, but really it's verbal. Things that we say, behavioral things that we do, environmental things that are around us, the pictures on the wall, the statues in the square, and they can be intentional, certainly, but for the most part, it's unintentional. We're not aware. And then they communicate slights and insults and snubs to people who have to second guess what you were saying to them or what your body language is. And so it really creates a psychological dilemma and stress for people who are in the marginalized groups to understand, is that a, is that a microaggression? Of course, they wouldn't use that term. So we look at this metaphor of managing the elephants while missing the termites. So these elephants, you know, they're these overt acts of discrimination, that blatant thing. What Donald Sterling said, it got caught on tape. You know, those are things that are publicly condoned. Um, and I like the, the quote that Kevin Johnson, who is the mayor of Sacramento, uh, he said, I hope that every bigot in this country sees what happened to Mr. Sterling and recognizes that if he can fall, so can you. But you have to be lucky, right? You'd be in the right place at the right time, public figure, get recorded, say something like that. And we have moral, legal, and social constraints now, luckily, that keep people in check. But there's so much going on that we don't see. So when we look at the elephants, when someone understands that you're a bigot or a sexist or a racist, they can more easily deal with that because they know your reputation. And so it's, it's something that we can expect from you. But if we don't know, it's much more difficult. And so we talk about the, the termites. And unfortunately, we're all termites right now. You know, we're, we're being overrun by these billions of termites. Now, what usually happens by the time you detect termites? It's too late. The structural integrity has been compromised, right? So all these little things, all these little termites, these, these things that are saying or doing or where we look around and we see brochures that feature all white men on it, we wouldn't think anything of it consciously. But these are messages that are being sent that are, that are cutting us, that are really undermining the egalitarian philosophy ideals that we, we espouse as a nation. So it's really these subtle, nearly invisible things that are creating the most damage, and things that we have to address in our institutions, in our, communi in our communities, in our nation as a whole. What are the messages being sent? 
So this was my uh, title slide for this. Microaggressions.com is a website where people put on microaggressions that they're experiencing. So you can go on if you want more, more examples. Um, but I want to share some examples with you. So these are some statements that on the surface might seem fine for most people here in the room. We don't detect any overt isms. It isn't blatant, it's not in your face. But all of these would be considered microaggressions under the definition. These are all microaggressions. And there's different types of microaggression. I'm not going to go into the detail of that today. But what's important to know is that there is um, some variation in terms of the doer's awareness and their intention. Uh, they all commu this, communicate this kind of overt or, or covert or hidden offensive messages and meanings to the recipient. So on uh, this slide, you see this last statement. He seems like a nice, articulate young man. And you have a young African-American professional. The micro-insult, really, to that statement being a, a, a microaggression is he's a credit to his race. That people of color are generally not as articulate or intelligent as whites. Because most people would think of a young African American male like this. And there are consequences. This is a macro, a micro assault uh, when you say these and they get away with it. And it leads to tragic consequences because here the microaggression was assumption of criminal status, assumption of criminality. And it relates to the belief that people of color are presumed to be dangerous, potentially criminal, and likely to break the law. So people who are receiving this and the target group are getting the message that they don't belong. They don't belong in this neighborhood. I live in a white neighborhood. We have a homeowners association meeting. And I was shocked. Well, maybe not shocked in Springfield, but I was, <laughs> okay, I was a little surprised at this homeowners association meeting. Uh, we were sitting around discussing uh, our neighborhood and how to improve our neighborhood. And this older woman said, you know, we have people that come into our neighborhood that go door to door. We don't have, we have a non-solicitation uh, policy. And those people come in and, and we have the right to call the police because they shouldn't be there. And I know exactly who she was talking about. Because we have these people who come to our neighborhood, they're young African-American uh, students that are trying to earn a living and, and pay for their education, they come and they sell subscriptions. Maybe some of your neighborhoods, they do it too. But the way that she was saying that with they, and I'm gonna call the police on them next time, and they shouldn't be here. Oh, but you're okay when you, you're the white kids in the neighborhood come around and are selling stuff for school. That's solicitation, right? So it, we have to understand how we're creating these disparities in our society when, when we're saying things like that. Um, you know, you're not the right kind of person. You don't belong here. And the intent is to threaten, intimidate, keep you out uh, because you're inferior. So let's look at some, some statements and let's look at the underlying message uh, to this. Uh, so I don't see color. I used to say that. I admit. I used to say that. You know, my, my dearest friend in elementary school was African American, Edith Godet. And we played all the time together. And I, I, we never discussed race because it wasn't in our vocabulary. And I, I just treated her like a friend until later on I understood all the institutional racism and structural uh, issues in this country and the history. And, but if you say that to someone, and I, I know where it's coming from. You know, we want everyone to be equal. We want this egalitarian ideal. But if you deny that person's experience, their, their racial and ethnic experiences in history, that's the micro mess, the micro uh, aggression. I'm not a homophobe. I'm immune to heterosexism. Oh, everyone can succeed. We hear this always at election time <laughs> during debates. Everyone can succeed if they work hard enough. Multimillionaires on the platform saying this, mostly white males. You know, so what's the message being sent? If you're not successful, you haven't worked hard enough. You know, tell that to the woman who's working three jobs and trying to support her family, trying to pay her way through school. 
and then we talked about the last one. <clears throat> Behavioral and body language, a lot, most of our communication happens through nonverbal, uh, happens with our body language, and so this is an elevator door. And I used to work in Miami, Florida, in a very tall building down in Biscayne Bay, and I, at that time I was working for Ernst & Young, I was a consultant, and I worked very, very long hours, as they do with young consultants. And uh, my car was parked in the parking garage, and, and I often left late at night. And I never thought of anything about getting on the elevator, going to the parking lot, garage, and I'm, I'm aware, I've lived in other countries, so I'm, I'm kind of aware of my environment, what's going on around me. You know, and very typically, I would get on the elevator and see a partner or uh, another uh, business professional, and I would get on the elevator, no problem. But what happened if I got on the elevator and saw this person? Did my heart rate go up, I maybe move to the other side of the elevator, or I'm a little more nervous, I'm not sure, a lot of things going through my mind. Why? I mean, and what are the messages that this person is receiving from me? That's a microaggression. That's a, that's a behavioral microaggression. And we do it all the time. We not, might even not be conscious about it. And, and now, you know, like this is 15, 18 years later, I make it a point to smile at people and from my heart, this, this love, this compassion, I try to, you know, I believe in this energy force that connects us all, but I really try to exude to people, you know, I love you, I'm, I'm accepting of you, whoever you are. And it changes, it really does change the dynamic, but you have to be deliberate, you have to be conscious about that. Let's look at some other examples. So, for you, for uh, those of you who fly, uh, especially after 9-11, <coughs> I was on the plane uh, a week after 9-11, uh, again, uh, out of Miami. And what would I think if I sat next to this person? And I have actually heard people on American Airlines make comments about people, and just blatantly, you know. Um, why? You know, I understand we're kind of like, again, it's these, these Things, the social conditioning, our society, the media, media outlet, you know, this sensationalism, we're trying to, fear factor, fear is a really strong thing. And it gets people to watch the news. And it gets the news to put on ads that leads to profit and higher market share. Follow the money. Another example. So as I mentioned, um, I started off in consulting and accounting, I was usually only female. But what if I'm hired as a new female senior officer or executive and I walk into my first board meeting or executive meeting and I see all these guys here? Like, can I really succeed here? It, it, is there an opportunity? Is there a path for me? Because I don't see any other woman. That's a microaggression. That's pretty blatant. But this happens all of the time. Why do you think we don't have as many women in leadership positions? Not that they're not capable. Another example from the airplane. When you hear the pilot come over the loudspeaker, about seven years ago, I was on a 777 flying to Brazil on American Airlines, and I heard the captain come on, and she said, welcome, and you know, here's our flight time, and I heard some rumbling and some gaps. And I was just like, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. female captain, yes. Um, so again, what's going through our mind? She can't fly the airplane. You don't need to be, you know, sort of size or weight requirement to fly an airplane. How about this one? You know, you're walking through the farmer's market or along the sidewalk, and I'm going to tell you, this is going to be more and more common than on black bread. But we see two people, adults of the same sex, holding hands. And, and, and some of you might have just not feel comfortable because you haven't grown up, you've been socially conditioned. This is wrong, this is immoral. Um, but what's your body language saying? What's, what's the microaggression that they're perceiving? 
Now this woman looks like she's eating something she's kind of looking away, but you know, you feel uncomfortable. I think this would be the norm. Um, in persons of different abilities, you know, you always focus on the dog, right? It's always the dog. I think the guy's pretty good looking, but you know, we focus on the dog and we ignore the person who's next to the dog. Is that that's a minor question? You can actually see who with it. They're looking at the dog. And the dog, yeah, cute dog. But those people feel like, hey, I'm here too. Ask me a question. Ask me how I'm doing. Um, this is a picture of me early in my career in, uh, in Argentina, uh, typically surrounded by all these men. So not only am I surrounded by all these men, they're all Latin men. Um, so I've, I've dealt with this for many, many, many years. Overt discrimination, covert, you know, I didn't really know what to label it or call it. Um, but when you're the only woman in the room, you get it. And again, I think they were well-intentioned, they're all professionals, they wanted to uh, treat me equitably, but they didn't know what they didn't know, right? They didn't take the red pill. Let's look at some common gender microaggressions. So I'm gonna use some words that are used to, accept, to describe the exact same behavior, but are applied differently for men versus women. So first one, he's aggressive. What do we say about women? She's bitchy. <laughs> he's good at details, but she's picky, right? He's moody, he must have had a rough day or a really bad night's sleep. <laughs> you know, she's moody with the hormones and all that going on. He's confident. She's too direct, or she's conceited. Any of you who read uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, but she cites this interesting um, correlation between likability and success. So men, as they become more successful, they become more likable. What do you think happens to women as they become more successful? They become less likable. Think about that one. But yeah, she's too direct. Emails, didn't put all that flowery language, cushion things, be nice. Uh, he's climbed the ladder to success. I know what you're thinking, but it's not that one. She got the reputation <laughs> because of her gender, right? So we hear these all the time. And unfortunately, a lot of women internalize this as well. You know, I can't be aggressive, or I can't be assertive, or I can't be this because I'm going to be labeled like that, and I don't want to be a bitch, and I don't want to be this, and I, I you know, so women internalize that. I think it's damaging for us as women because we've made a lot of progress, but if we look at the data, if we look at the statistics, we haven't really. Um, and, and sexism has morphed into this, again, this very ambiguous, subtle, kind of invisible form. And the less obvious nature of sexism is it's powerful, it's detrimental to men and women. And language is powerful because it communicates to women something about their worth in society. And if we internalize it, it can lead to lower feelings of self-worth and competency. It actually can affect our performance. So it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I've got to move on, I was going to tell a story there, but... So if we even look at, does anyone know who this is? Mary Barra, new CEO of GM. So, you know, women, 4.6% of the Fortune 500 companies, even though we make up half the workforce. So we're gonna do a group activity uh, real quick. So you should all have had handouts as you came in. Um, and you can either work alone or with the person next to you. And what you're going to do is you're going to read the statement. You're going to decide yes or no if, if you think it's a microaggression. And then just jot down some underlying messages. So if you think it's a microaggression, you can yes. Write down quickly what you think that underlying micro message is, that microaggression. Make sense?
So I kind of gave you the answer to the first one. Right? So what was your answer? Yes? Okay. So the, uh, the underlying assumption of criminal status. And, and uh, Dr. Sue has a couple pages in this book where uh, the terminology is very, very well laid out. He talks about the themes, the microaggression, the message, really broken down into these uh, themes. So how about the second one? What did you have for the second one? Okay, this was a trick one. And the reason that it's no is because the doctor is recognizing, has taken my lecture, and recognizes that the microaggressions that her patient has experienced has led to some health outcomes. Um, and we have data that supports that. So she's recognizing race as a legitimate factor of her being exposed from her infancy um, and has a, a conversation with the parent, with the patient about that. Okay? So that would be no. Uh, how about the next one? Yes, you don't fit in here. The chances of you doing well are small. Your group is not valued here. Um, my insurance is at a Cox Hospital, and I always walk into, um, because I'm sensitized to this, I always look at the pictures on the wall. And I think this was a several years back, but all the board of directors, white male doctors, white male, you know, and that, 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 that does bother me. It does bother me. Um, and so, again, the message is, you know, chances of succeeding here are, are very slim. But we'll hold, hold your question. Sorry. Okay. Um, the next, yes, if you think that everybody who's in authority is male, then you're consciously in the matrix of the well, you know, CEOs, presidents, you know, go down the list. They're all key. Fire, firefighters, firemen police officers, police men, you know, so we can kind of grow up in this image that all authority figures are men. And that has impact. How about the next one? You're looking nice today, Anita. That would be no, it's a compliment. Now, when would it morph into a microaggression? If I were working for a man and every day the only thing that he commented on was how I looked, and not on my performance, then that would be a microaggression because he's not recognizing my contribution. But if he always said, oh, yeah, you're looking hot today, you're looking good, it's never about my quality of work or my performance, then it would be a microaggression. But that's just a compliment. People like compliments. So don't get too hung up about that. Okay, the next one, yes. So we tend to ignore people that we don't value as much or don't have value in society. And so that's the theme of the second class citizen. They're often overlooked or what they have to contribute is not as weighted. How about the next one? Pretty obvious. Uh, I did a version of this two hour workshop with MoDOT around the state of Missouri and I brought up the Confederate flag. I hit a hot button on that one. I did have some people, I had one man in a class who actually had the Confederate flag tattooed on his arm and showed it to me. And I said, I understand that, but if you are a manager and you want to succeed in MoDOT, go as far as you can, and you're managing people of color, you have to understand the history of that symbol. You know, I was in Munich, Germany two, two weeks ago, and uh, I took a tour called the World War II tour of Munich, and they put up uh, they had flags there, the Nazi flag, and they looked at a building. It was just absolutely incredible, uh, the power of symbols. Okay, how about the next one? What do you think? Yes, why? Because if you ask someone, 
because of the way they look where he or she was born, you're assuming what? You know, they've been here for three generations. They're just as American as all of us. And they're always asked that question, like, gosh, I'm like born and bred in Kansas, raised, and I'm, you know, I'm always asked that I'm, you know, assume that I'm not from here. And then how about the last one? Yes. Because there's that assumption of abnormality, that something's abnormal or pathological <laughs> about being lesbian. Okay? So how we do? Okay? As I said, I threw in some, some trick ones there. So why does this all matter? I mean, we really need to understand why this matters. Because one microaggression by itself is minimally impactful, but people who have been exposed to this on a daily basis from the time they were an infant it has impact, has detrimental consequences. And this is being studied more and more, so we have more data to support this. But there's a negative impact on health. It can cause anger and frustration, low self-esteem, emotional turmoil. It can create a hostile working environment. It decreases productivity and problem-solving ability. It perpetuates stereotypes and disparities in employment, in healthcare, and education. And what many whites fail to realize is that people of color, LGBT, people who, are dis uh, who have disabilities, they're subjected to these multiple microaggressions from the time that they're born, from they're born, by their peers, by teachers, by the media, by education. And so they're so pervasive that they're often unrecognized. And so we can look at some data, and I actually had to pull some out because I have a lot of data. Um, but if we just look at life expectancy for blacks as compared to white, five years lower. If we look at Hispanics, two and a half times as many Hispanics report not having a doctor. Uh, if we look at unemployment data, uh, double the amount for blacks. And if we look over a 24-year period, what is explaining that top line? Blacks and African Americans, Hispanics, um, continue to be higher. What is that saying and what is causing that to happen? Incarceration, I can spend a lot of time on this. We take number one in the world of incarcerating most of our citizens. Um, but African Americans 13 times more likely than whites to be incarcerated for the same drug offenses. Uh, spending on prison six times higher than on higher education. I bet you guys would love those dollars. Uh, $70 billion we spend to incarcerate. That's one out of 107 adults in this country are incarcerated, and that's disproportionately people of color. Think about that. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but in terms of people who actually make the laws and the policy, uh, who set the climate, who set the tone, you know, if they're all from one mindset, from all one mental model of the world, that has impact. So uh, if decision makers are people of all the same group, you're talking about white Euro male, uh, Euro American males, um, that has an impact. Uh, if we look at just succession data, and I did a lot of this work, uh, succession planning in my career, um, we look at, this is people one step from being a CEO, continuing that trend. 66% of those, one step from being a CEO, white men. 19% white women, fewer than 3% are African American, 4% Latinos, and 8% Asian Americans. So we're not fixing this problem either. And for the LGBTQ community, the hiding is exhausting. Not being able to be who you are is exhausting. And so there's considerable evidence that exposure to being afraid, to, being, uh, to heterosexual prejudice and discrimination is related to elevated stress, depression, anxiety. We see that in the LGBT community, there are higher risk, higher risk for substance abuse and alcohol-related problems. So the bottom line is we are doing ourselves a disservice as a society, as a nation, um, because microaggressions have impact. You know, we're not just competing amongst ourselves, we're competing against <laughs> other nations around the world. And, the U.S. is slipping behind, except on military spending and incarceration. But we're slipping behind on almost every indicator. We need everybody's talent. We need everybody's potential. Um, 
We can't solve the, the world's most pressing problems if people can't be who they are, if they're not valued for what they contribute and say, if we don't have more people in leadership positions and there's more diversity in that. So what can we do? Now this is a big problem, okay? So now I have revealed the truth. You are now aware. So I am now holding you all accountable and responsible uh, for helping to change that. Uh, one thing is constant vigilance, and that's being aware of your own biases and prejudices, where they come from. Uh, experiential reality, understanding that your reality is not other people's reality. And so it's difficult for you to see other people's perspective if you don't know where they're coming from. And so you as a dominant group, if you're a white American, you often think that you have an accurate perception of reality because you're in the dominant group. Uh, so your worldview may be culture-bound and prevent you from seeing the eyes of the world through a different group. Also, don't be defensive. You know, sometimes we're afraid of this because it opens up the exposure, like I might be considered you know, sexist or heterosexist or uh, uh, prejudiced in some way. And so if we hide and we don't have these conversations, we're never going to solve the problem. So we need to be uh, open to having these conversations and engaging with other people and having forums where we can discuss this. I know Je uh, Jeff Johnson last week had sessions, you know, why I hate blacks, why I hate gays. <laughs> Very provocative. Um, and if you're called out on a microaggression, you know, rather than being de defensive about it, try to explore it. Where did this come from? You know, I'm trying to clarify it. You know, that will build a lot of trust and it, it will start leading to these positive relationships. And I think we'll grow. And sometimes all you have to say is, I'm sorry. I didn't, under I didn't understand that. I didn't know. So does self-awareness make a difference? This is a, a Prius or hybrid car. We know that people who drive these cars love to be. They love to get more and more efficiency. And we know that any system with feedback tends to improve. And so you can learn to provide feedback for yourselves and uh, about your own thoughts, behaviors, and actions. So. One thing is paying attention and living deliberately. That five minutes a day, I tell you, will help change your life just by centering yourself, being quiet. But sometimes we're just not paying attention. We're on autopilot. Uh, I think it's important that we drag our subconscious into the light and we understand that, hey, I admit I have biases and prejudices. I am a, I'm a product of social conditioning. I'm in the matrix. But I'm going to wake up. I'm going to tell the truth. And I'm going to start talking to other people about that. You have to let go of that guilt of having prejudicial thoughts. We all have them. We're all those termites. And deal with the reality. Understand what's happening in your head and commit to personal change. One thing I, I recommend to people is understanding history from the group, uh, from the perspective of other people's groups. How many of you have heard of this book or read the book or know how it's in? Uh, you know, whose reality is accurate? You want to ask, if you want to understand sexism, do you ask a man or a woman? If you want to understand homophobia, do you ask a straight person? Or someone who's gay? If you want to understand racism, do you ask a white person? So, if you want to understand oppression, you ask the oppressor. Do you ask the oppressor or the oppressed? I think the, the answer is pretty obvious there. So, understand that. And then, when you think of an American, what image comes to mind? Remember, our social conditioning is so powerful and so dominant uh, in our dominant culture. As I said, I have lots of other uh, data points, but we're almost wrapping up. So, I want to challenge you to live outside your comfort zone. and understand what are the footprints that you leave behind by saying, I was here. I was here.
Tech Secrets.